Hey man, good to have everybody here. I know it's I know it's cold. I think I said last year it was rainy or it been raining, and this morning it's cold. I think I'd rather have the cold than the rain. Y'all may differ, but that's okay. But I appreciate y'all getting up and coming out as we honor this day and to honor the uh, resurrection of our Lord and Savior. What a uh, what a glorious morning when Christ came. And when he gave his life, and then he resurrected himself from the dead. And we find out here in, in John chapter number 20, I got to thinking, what must those have thought? What must have been on their minds as uh, those that came to the tomb to discover that Christ wasn't there? What must they have been thinking when they came to the tomb? And what, what was told? What's the story told? Uh, as they came and, um, and what must have went through their mind. In John chapter 20, the first day of the week, cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. So we know there were several people going to the tomb that morning and to see and to, you know, to check on the body of Jesus. They still loved him dearly. Uh, they knew that, uh, you know, that he had been crucified. They knew that he had been laid in that tomb, and they were coming with prepared ointments and spices to anoint the body of Jesus again. Uh, Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, John is who the other disciple was, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together. The other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. So here comes John and Peter. They're running toward the sepulcher to see where, uh, you know, where Christ is and see what Mary Magdalene is telling them. And uh, John comes running. He outruns Peter, and then Peter catches up to him. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down. John, John was stooping down, and he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet when he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen cloths lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again, unto their own home. So there they came, there they looked in, there they saw that Jesus wasn't there. And so as, as we look at this place and, and we get in our minds the picture of this place, and certainly it's just a big uh, hole carved out in the rock, and I went in there and looked and saw the place where the Lord lay and his mouth wasn't big enough to contain me uh, to know that the Son of God did lie in that place and he was placed there as a dead man. And yet we know here the scripture tells us that he wasn't there. When these went to see him, uh, he wasn't there. And what, what are some of the things that we see in this empty tomb? I'll give you three things. Uh, about 20 minutes later we'll go. No, about 10 minutes but I'll be through and maybe. Uh, but if the sun ain't come up, I'm going to still keep preaching until the sun comes up. Amen. The moon's going down back there behind you, so uh, the sun will be up here shortly. <clears throat> But we see here that this is a place of fulfilled prophecy. You remember Christ in his own words said, you know, said if, if you uh, put this temple down in three days, I will raise it up again. Jesus was the only one that could ever resurrect himself from the grave. Uh, if they didn't, you know, of course they thought they stole the body of Jesus. No, Christ resurrected himself from the grave. What is the significance of that? The gospel, my friend, depends upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And without that resurrection, there is no gospel to be preached. We all know that that is a fulfilled prophecy. We also see that this is a place of perfection where the gospel was made perfect. Without the resurrection, again I say to you, the gospel 
would have no effect. It would be it would be not completed. Uh, the, the birth of Christ, how wonderful it is to understand and know that Jesus was born of a virgin and his sinless life. No man's ever done that before. No one has ever lived in this life sinless and perfect, but Christ did. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. And when at the crucifixion of Christ, there is you cannot imagine the pain and suffering that Jesus went for uh, when he died on the cross of Calvary. What he suffered, you and I cannot imagine such suffering as Christ did on the cross. The most excruciating pain that man could ever imagine, Christ suffered on the cross. If you haven't ever done a study on the crucifixion, you need to do that. You need to understand exactly what Christ suffered as his bones came out of joint and his arms came out of out of socket and and uh, all the all the pain that he went he did it for you friend he did it for me but that in itself was not the completion of the gospel he paid my sin debt on Calvary he bore my sin debt he you know sin became sin for me on the cross of Calvary he shed his blood for me on the cross of Calvary but that in itself did not complete the gospel. So we see this is a place of perfection. How do you mean, preacher? We see that if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. So he had to, to make the gospel complete, to make our faith complete. Christ had to rise from the grave. And so we see, last of all, that this is a place of promise. Oh, I'm glad that it's a place of promise. Christ is not there. He did arise from the grave. And the promise is that he's coming back. And we see that, and I mention this probably every year, but we see the, the crucifixion and we see the resurrection and we see the promise of his coming again by the napkin that, was, that he saw laying beside the, the cloth where Jesus had resurrected himself from. Now, uh, Christ came out of that, that hull, that uh, uh, grave cloth that he was bound in, and when he got up out of that, he took the napkin that was around his face and head, and he folded it up and he laid it to the side. Now, why did he do that? Why did Christ lay that to the side? Why did the scripture say that he found that and it was laid to the side separate uh, from, from the other grave cloth? I'm going to tell you why. In Jewish tradition, and, and when you sit down at a Jewish table, when you get through with your meal, if you uh, wad that napkin up and, and throw it on the plate, uh, that means you're through. But if you, you know, you have to get up for some reason or other, and uh, you get up and you fold that napkin, and you lay it to the side over here, people look and see, well, he's not finished yet. Amen, he's not finished He's going to come back. Oh, friend, that folded napkin shows me and tells me that it is a place of promise. This empty tomb is a place of promise, being that Jesus himself promised when he folded that napkin and laid it to the side, I'm coming back. Amen? And that is the promise that we have this morning. Not only do we serve a risen Savior, but we serve a returning Savior, one that's coming back. For you and I thank God for Easter amen we get excited about Christmas but praise God for Easter the the perfection of the gospel and the promise that he went away but thank God one glorious morning he's going to come back amen amen let's pray father we thank you Lord for the word of God we thank you God for your great blessings upon us and for the promise of your return Lord help us to be faithful to you come again in Jesus name we pray Amen, amen. All right, anything, anyone got anything before we go back inside?